good evening, everyone. A warm welcome to Professor Tagaki Kajita, distinguished colleagues, members of the public, and everyone on this online platform. I'm Phil Chan, Deputy Head from the Physics Department of National University of Singapore, and will be your moderator for this session. I'm delighted to introduce our distinguished speaker this evening, Professor Takaki uh, and Kajita. In, and he is the 2015 Nobel Laureate for Physics and both a distinguished university professor and the director of the Institute of Cosmic Ray uh, at the University of Tokyo. He received his Doctor of Philosophy uh, from Tokyo University in 1986 and uh, studied under the eminent Japanese uh, physicist, Professor uh, Masato Shi. Uh, Koshiba. For the past half a century, Japan played an important role, in fact, a leading role in neutrino physics. In 1980, Professor Koshiba pioneered the construction of the huge neutrino detector uh, located underground in Haida in Jifu uh, Prefecture. Professor Koshiba used this experiment to detect neutrinos from a distant supernova explosion in the process became one of the founders of neutrino as, uh, astronomy. The work led him to share the Nobel Prize uh, in 2002 with Professor Raymond Davis and Professor Ricardo Giacconi for detecting uh, neutrino oscillation. It was when Professor Kushiba was carrying out his Nobel Prize winning work, our guest speaker this evening, Professor Kujita was still a physics student then, was inspired to work under the guidance of uh, Koshiba. After Professor Kujita's doctorate degree, he joined the Institute of Cosmic Ray in Tokyo, playing a key role to show that the ratio of electron to muon neutrinos coming uh, from opposite sides of the Earth is different. This significant finding meant that the neutrinos that were created when cosmic rays interact with nuclei in the upper atmosphere, change the flavor, or sometimes known as oscillation, as they pass through the Earth and must therefore have a tiny mass. And as you know, Professor Kajito won the Nobel Prize for this together with Professor Arthur McDonald, who led an experiment in Canada uh, in the SNOW experiment. Professor Kajita is also a multi-talented physicist in 2008, long before he won the Nobel Prize, he made a bold decision to switch research to gravitational wave detection. That same year, he became the director of Institute of Cosmic Ray Research and played a major role in getting funding for the Kagra project. And Kagra project is now an international, uh, joined the international effort to hunt for gravitational waves. Recently, 2017, Professor Kajita was elected into the prestigious Science Council of Japan. As CJ's role is to make recommendations to the Japanese government and the society pertaining to science. And he was also nominated as the president for SGC, uh, SCJ in 2020. Through SG, SCJ, Professor Kajita hopes to communicate the important role of fundamental science to the public which he believes is an important and doing, as important as doing science itself. He said, in a recent Physics World interview, science has become so important for deciding the direction and the society and even the future of Earth. Physics is clearly one of the important parts of science. Without further ado, uh, we would like to invite Professor Kajita, our distinguished speaker today, uh, uh, to share with us this evening. Okay, Professor Kajita. Okay. Thank you very much <clears throat> for the kind introduction. <clears throat> now, today I want to talk about neutrino oscillations, and let me share my slide. <clears throat> okay. Um. Today I'm going to talk about our work on neutrinos. And in this page, you see a photo. This is the inside of Super Kamiokande. So today I'm going to talk about the neutrino studies in Super Kamiokande. 
Okay, um, this is the outline. First, I have a brief introduction on neutrinos. Then I want to discuss our early work in Kamiokande. Then I want to move on to the discovery of neutrino oscillations. And also I want to mention the importance of small neutrino mass. And I want to summarize this talk. Okay, what are neutrinos? Well, neutrinos are fundamental particles like electrons and quarks. And they are something like electrons without electric charge. And in fact, this has a significant consequence. Neutrinos can easily pass through even the Earth, but they can interact with matter very rarely. Therefore, we are able to study neutrinos. And neutrinos have, like the other particles, three types or three flavors, namely electron neutrinos, muon neutrinos, and tau neutrinos. And neutrinos have been assumed to have no mass. And we can detect them uh, by this uh, way. Um, so we observe particles created by a neutrino interaction with the nucleus. Then, uh, for example, if this nucleus is in water, then this particle emit chunk of photons, and therefore we observe these particles by detecting chunk of photons by photodetectors. Okay, now I want to move on to our early work. Well, I'm going to talk about the Kamiokande experiment, and in fact. The original motivation for the Kamiokande experiment was the search for proton decays. In the 70s, grand unified theories of elementary particles predicted that protons should decay with the lifetime of about 10 to 30 years. Well, certainly 10 to 30 years is a very long lifetime, but this can be detectable. Therefore, Several proton decay experiments began in the early 80s, and one of them was the Kamiokande experiment. And here I show the sketch of the Kamiokande detector. It is a large underground water detector. It had a water tank of about 16 meters in diameter and 16 meters in height. And this tank contained 3,000 tons of very clean water. And also inside, uh, we installed about 1,000 photomultiplier tubes to detect chunk of radiation. Well, certainly, if a proton decays, uh, then two to three particles are emitted, and these particles radiate chunk of photons. Therefore, we'd like to observe these photons by these photodetectors. And this way, we wanted to observe proton decays. And of course, uh, in order to observe proton decays, we have to construct the detector. And this photo was taken in the spring of 1983, when we constructed the Kamiokande detector. And this photo was taken at the entrance of the active mine. So we constructed the Kamiokande detector in active mine. And the construction work was something like that, like this. So we had to install photomultiplier tubes inside the Kamiokande tank. And in order to do so, um, we installed these plastic bolts. Namely, um, we, we used these bolts to, to install the photomultiplier tubes at the specific height. 
And if we finish one layer, then we raise the water level by, by one meter, then we start the next layer. So this way, um, we constructed the Kamiokande detector. And we started the experiment in July 1983. And of course, we wanted to observe proton decays. Unfortunately, we observed only background events. They are neutrino interactions. And these neutrinos are created in the atmosphere. Cosmic ray particles come into the atmosphere and interact with air nucleus. Then typically pions are created and of course pions are unstable, therefore decay to a muon, then to electron. And during this decay chain, neutrinos are created. And these neutrinos, most of them simply pass through even the earth, but some of them interact in the Kamiokande detector. And these are the most serious background to the search for proton decays. Therefore, we have to study these background events. And let me talk about our story around 1986. In well, in 1986, we still tried to observe proton decays, but until that time, we had significant number of atomic neutrino background events. Therefore, we decided to develop new software to improve the proton decay analysis. Namely, we wanted to better separate the proton decay signal and the neutrino background. Anyway, we developed this new software and as a test, the neutrino type was studied for the atmospheric neutrino events so far observed in Kamiokande. Then we found that the muon neutrino events the number of muon neutrino events was much fewer than expected. And by the way, in this slide, in the right side, I show a typical muon neutrino event observed in Kamiokande. So this type of event was much fewer than expected. We thought that it's very likely that there were some mistakes somewhere in the data analysis. Th that means somewhere in the new software. So we started various studies to find out mistakes. Well, we worked hard. We worked for more than one year to find out mistakes. But we were unable to find any serious mistake so after about one year of studies, we concluded that the muon neutrino deficit cannot be due to any major problem in the data analysis. So we thought that this might be the reality. So we decided to publish our data and the essence of the publication is shown here. So we counted the number of muon neutrino events and compared with the expectation. And we found there is a significant deficit in the muon neutrino events. We also counted the electron neutrino events and compared with the simulation. And for the electron neutrino events, the data and the and the expectation agreed reasonably well. So that's all we discussed. Well, it was clear there's something strange going on. But at that time, the world community was not 
very well world community was still skeptical about this data and also in addition we had no clear idea what was the cause of the deficit but anyway i was most excited with the data and i changed my research completely from the proton decay studies to neutrino studies to know what is happening in neutrinos well clearly with this data alone um we were unable to find out the cause of the deficit there could be several possibilities however from the beginning we have been thinking that maybe the mu neutrino deficit could be due to neutrino oscillations but neutrino oscillation was predicted more than half a century ago by theorists Maki Nakagawa Sakata and Ponte Corvo. According to them, if neutrinos have mass, neutrinos change their type from one type to the other. For example, as shown in this figure, um, new neutrino could oscillate to tau neutrinos. <clears throat> And the blue curve shows the probability that mu neutrino to remain mu neutrinos. And as you can see, at some point, this probability goes down. And at that time, the probability mu neutrino changed to tau neutrino goes up. So this is the neutrino oscillations. And if this is happening, um, that data can be naturally explained. However, as I said, there were several other possibilities. So we wanted to distinguish neutrino oscillations from other possibilities. And for this, we thought this way. Well, these neutrinos are created in the atmosphere. Therefore, some of these neutrinos are created above the detector, say 10 to 20 kilometers above the detector. And these neutrinos come to the detector after traveling 10 to 20 kilometers. And probably, maybe, the flight length is not long enough for neutrinos to change their type. However, these neutrinos are also created in the other side of the Earth. And these neutrinos have to come to the detector after traveling long distances in the Earth. Typically, they have to travel, say, 10,000 kilometers. So these neutrinos have to travel long distances, therefore they may oscillate. So if we think this way, we should observe up versus down asymmetry of the atmospheric neutrino. And if this is observed, this can be the evidence for neutrino oscillations. Unfortunately, the 3000 ton Kamiokande detector was not big enough to observe uh, this kind of uh, phenomena. So we needed a much larger detector. And that was Super Kamiokande. Now I'd like to move on to the discovery of neutrino oscillations in Super Kamiokande. Um, Super Kamiokande is a uh, larger version of the original Kamiokande detector. It is a 50,000 ton water Cherenkov detector. The diameter is about 40 meters and the height is also about 40 meters. 
So, compared with the original Kamiokande, the fiducial mass that can be used for the physics analysis about 20 times larger. So, with this detector, we can accumulate um, neutrino data substantially quick, quicker compared with the Kamiokande case. And this is an international collaboration. At present, we have about 200 collaborators from 10 countries. And I'd like to show you this figure. This photo was taken when we constructed the Super Kamiokande detector. In fact, the year 1995, we worked in underground to construct the Super Kamiokande detector. Anyway, the construction work went well, and we started filling pure water into the Super Kamiokande detector in January 96, and this photo was taken at that time. On the neutrino event, looks like this. This is a typical atmospheric muon neutrino event observed in Super Kamiokande. So, in Super Kamiokande, we observe about 10 neutrino events in a day. And many collaborators studied these events as a team. So, um, after two years, we were able to report our major result at the Neutrino Conference. And this is one of the slides we used at the conference. Well, certainly before this century, we didn't have PowerPoint. So we used the uh, plastic film to show our result. And well, in fact, this is very important. And in fact, this was a very important data. This shows the uh, neutrino arrival direction distribution for electron neutrino events and muon neutrino events. Electrons are shown in the upper panel, and muon neutrinos are in the lower panel. And cosine theta one means downgoing neutrinos coming from above. And cosine theta minus one means upward going neutrinos coming from the other side of the earth. Then these small black circles with error bars show the data. And the hatched histogram shows the Monte Carlo expectation without oscillations. And you can see for downgoing neutrinos, the data and the simulation agreed quite well. However, for upward going neutrinos, the data showed almost a factor of two deficit compared with the expectation. And this can be naturally explained if we assume new mu to new tau oscillations, namely, Muon neutrinos created in the other side of the Earth have to travel long distance before arriving Super Kamiokande. And during this travel, the muon neutrino change their type to tau neutrinos. And well, they have to change continuously their type. And therefore, when they arrived at the Super Kamiokande detector, the probability that muon neutrino to remain as muon neutrino is essentially one half. So this way, um, the neutrino community was convinced that neutrinos oscillate. And therefore, we knew that neutrinos have small mass. And of course, we reported this result at the conference for neutrino physicists, but something unexpected happened. The President Clinton 
at the United States, gave a talk at MIT's 98 commencement. And well, this was about 30 minutes long. And during this talk, he mentioned our result. And let me read what he said. Just yesterday in Japan, physicists announced the discovery that tiny neutrinos have mass. Now, that may not mean much to most Americans, but it may change our most fundamental theories from the nature of the smallest subatomic particles to how the universe itself works and indeed how it expands. And of course, as the US president, he mentioned the contribution of the US physicist in Super Kamiokande. Then he, he continued, the larger issue is that this, these kinds of findings have implications that are not limited to the laboratory. They affect the whole of society, not only our economy, but the very view of life, our understanding of our relations with others, and our place in time. Clearly, this was very nice words to, uh, to us, and I was very happy to hear uh, uh, this um, talk. Now, in the remaining time, I'd like to talk about the importance of the small neutrino mass. Well, you may ask why we are so excited with the neutrino mass. Well, certainly electrons have mass, quarks have mass, Therefore, in a sense, it is natural that neutrinos have mass. Why we are so excited? Well, certainly we are excited because neutrino mass are small. Let me show the neutrino mass. After more than 20 years of studies, we have a rather good idea on the neutrino mass themselves. And they are here. So clearly, neutrino mass are very small. And neutrino mass are pro approximately, or maybe more than 10 billion. That means 10 orders of magnitude smaller than the corresponding mass of quarks and charged leptons. 10 orders of magnitude smaller. And we believe this is the key to better understand elementary particles and the universe. So we are excited. Of course, if, if we understand why neutrino mass are so small, we could understand elementary particles better. But why universe is related? Well, in fact, we think neutrino mass could be related to the, to, to the mystery of the universe. Well, here I show a photo of the far universe. There are many stars and galaxies. And we know that all these stars and galaxies are made of matter. We know there's no antimatter star or antimatter galaxy. Well, this seems to be so trivial. However, if we think about the uh, history of the universe, we realize that this is not trivial. We, we know that the universe began with Big Bang. In the Big Bang universe, the temperature of the universe was extremely hot. And in this extremely hot universe, Particles and antiparticles are always created simultaneously. Therefore, we naively expect there should have been equal number of particles and antiparticles in the Big Bang hot universe. Then with the universe cool down, these particles and antiparticles meet and annihilate. So we naively expect there should be no matter particles in the present day universe, no antimatter particles. However, of course, we know that there are matter particles. 
why? Well, we, I think we understand. At the Big Bang universe, there was, say, one billion plus one num uh, matter particles. On the other hand, the number of antimatter particles was one billion. Of, and one billion plus one and one billion are almost equal. <clears throat> then with the universe cool down, these particles meet and annihilate, and therefore at present we have only one matter particle. So this way we understand the mechanism. However, we do not understand why there was extra one in matter particles. Well, to be honest, we do not know the answer to this question. But many physicists think that neutrinos with very small mass might be the key to understand the big mystery of the matter in the universe. So, <clears throat> Therefore, if this idea is correct, we understand the mystery of the universe. Therefore, we think we should study neutrinos more. And we'd like to know if the neutrinos are related to the origin of the matter in the universe. And to, un to answer to this question, we'd like to observe if neutrino oscillation of neutrinos and those of anti-neutrinos are different. If we observe the difference, that could be the first step to understand the origin of the matter in the universe. However, in order to observe this effect, we need the next generation long baseline experiments with much higher performance in neutrino detectors. And in fact, there are two large projects going on. One is in United States. This is called uh, LBNF Dune. Another is the Hyper Kamiokan project located in Japan. And I would like to briefly discuss this Hyper Kamiokan project. <clears throat> Hyper Kamiokan will be a still larger neutrino detector. It will be about 70 meters in diameter and 70 meters in height. The fiducial volume that can be used for the physics analysis could be eight times larger than Super Kamiokande. And because of this very large mass, uh, we have many important research topics in neutrino physics and astrophysics. And this detector is under construction, and the experiment will start in 2027. Here, I show one photo. This is the excavation of the access tunnel to Hyper Kamiokande. So in order to construct the uh, Hyper Kamiokande detector, we started from the uh, excavation of the access tunnel. Anyway, uh, this is really a very large scientific project the Hyperkamiokande collaboration have about 500 members from 20 countries. So this is really a, going to be a very large a global project. OK, let me summarize. Atomic like mu neutrino deficit was observed unexpectedly by proton decay experiments. Subsequently, in 1998, Super Kamiokande discovered neutrino oscillations, which shows that neutrinos have mass. The discovery of non-zero neutrino mass opened the window to study physics beyond the standard model of particle physics. And neutrinos with small mass might also be the key to understand the fundamental questions of the universe. And finally, I feel that I was very fortunate I had very good advisor, colleagues, and I was involved in very good project. And finally, I want to say, if we work hard and if we are lucky, 
nature can you tell us the secret of it okay that's all from me thank you uh, for your interesting talk and uh, your quotations from the former president <laughs> okay uh, right now we open to the floor for some questions uh, there's one question uh, that just came in do, do you think that the observations of the cosmic neutrino background could provide evidence for heavy neutrinos in the early universe and in turn the seesaw effect? Thank you very much for this question. Uh, first of all, I, I believe you mentioned about the um, two Kelvin cosmic neutrinos. First of all, if we are able to observe this cosmic background neutrinos, that could be a, really a breakthrough in science. We have, well, as far as I know, we have no idea how we can detect them. So it will be really exciting if, if you are able to observe cosmic background neutrinos. Okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, re recent, recently, it seems that uh, sterile neutrinos may be ruled out by the mini bone experiment. Could you share with us your thoughts on the evidence of sterile neutrinos or its possible role in uh, the standard model? Well, thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm, actually, I'm very sorry. <laughs> I'm not updated my knowledge. My <laughs> well, as far as I know, uh, uh, the Mini Boon 2021 paper still claim some excess. And um, well, maybe I, I'm just too, I'm not updated, but uh, as far as I know, they still claim the uh, um, excess. And therefore, in that sense, the sterile neutrino was not excluded at that time. But certainly, uh, sterile neutrino is a very important topic. And I definitely want to see the uh, future data. And I'd like to know the firm conclusion, either evidence or exclusion of sterile neutrinos. OK, yeah, thank you. OK. we, we... I can have a couple of more questions. Uh, what are the detection rates of events with the hyper uh, chemical day? Uh, are, you, uh, are we at the stage uh, to do faster data analysis with huge event rates? Oh, well, thank you. Well, certainly compared with uh, super chemical day, event rate will, will be much higher. And, well, actually, um, I do not remember exact number. I'm very sorry, but compared with the present Super Kamiokande experiment, well, at present, Super Kamiokande is exposed to the beam from JPAC, and this experiment is called T2K. And compared with the present T2K, the event rate will be about 25 times higher. And therefore, we have a reasonably um, higher event statistics compared with Super Kamiokande. Yeah. All right. Uh, one question. Due to oscillation, we now know that neutrinos uh, have tiny mass. Would you like to comment on the possible, possible mechanism on how neutrinos may acquire mass, unlike uh, other fundamental particles which got their mass from the Higgs mechanism? Oh, okay, thank you. Yeah, yes, yes. This is a very important point. Um, other particles, electrons or quarks, they acquire mass by Higgs mechanism. But clearly, neutrino mass is extremely small. Therefore, we believe that the mechanism of the neutrino mass generation is different. And many people think that neutrino mass is generated by the mechanism called seesaw mechanism 
and according to this uh, mechanism or model, right. uh, yeah. there must be extremely heavy neutrino-like particle. And because of this extremely heavy uh, mass, um, neutrino get a very small mass. I, I'm sorry, I cannot explain very well, but uh, this kind of quantum effect, uh, neutrino get the right, uh, right. very small mass. Yeah. Okay, I think we have uh, time only for one more last question. Uh, uh, we have, I think, a lot of uh, young physicists and budding physicists uh, in our midst and on, online. Uh, one last, perhaps a personal question. You are a man of many talents. Uh, you have moved to gravitational wave astronomy. Uh, what inspired you, inspired you to do that? <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much for this question. Well, um, well, I moved gravitational wave around 2008, but before uh, 2008, I worked in neutrino physics for more than 20 years, and I thought that 20 years is really a long period. And I wanted to do something new and something exciting again. <laughs> so I decided to change my research topic to, new, to, to gravitational waves. Yeah. Yes, certainly exciting. Yeah. OK, uh, in the interest of time, uh, let's uh, thank the speaker for taking his time uh, all the way from Japan and to be with us this evening. So uh, once again, we, we thank the speaker. Thank you very much. OK, uh, thank you uh, for all of you to spend this evening with us. And goodbye. Bye bye.